Okay. Okay. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think we're going to begin. It's so nice to see so many people uh, here at the American Jewish Archives. Uh, for those of you who are coming in right now, of course, just like on the high holy days, you have to have the good seats in the front. Uh, at any rate, uh, I, I want to extend a very warm and uh, cordial welcome to each and every one of you to the historic Cincinnati campus of Hebrew Union College and, of course, the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives. Uh, we are celebrating uh, Jewish American Heritage Month. Uh, it is a national uh, month uh, that is proclaimed every May 1st ever since 2004. And this is our special contribution to that particular uh, event. And so uh, we're so happy that all of you made it out this evening and will be joining us. I always like to ask how many people here are visiting our campus for the very first time. Please put your hands up high. Well, welcome. I'm very glad to have you here. Uh, this, it, 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 this, there's actually a special blessing, which I'll omit at this point, but uh, we, but, well, it, it is a special blessing for all those who visit this really remarkable campus. So uh, I want to, uh, first of all, there are a number of people I should introduce here. Uh, you know, we have in, in the Jewish tradition, by the way, this is good that this is happening you should silence your phones. <laughs> you know, I have a colleague who, when he leads services, he always says, you know, if your phone goes off during services, I need to start at services at the beginning. So that'll remind you, you know. <laughs> so uh, uh, there's probably, a, uh, there's this uh, a great teacher in the Jewish tradition by the name of Maimonides, and he is famous, among many things, for having created what's known as this ladder of righteousness. And uh, according to this great scholar, uh, it's important to be righteous, and uh, there's actually levels of righteousness. And I believe the second highest level, according to Maimonides, is when you do something for someone, and that someone doesn't know from whence that goodness came, and the person who receives it doesn't know where it's come from, and you don't know to whom it's going. That's very high on the level of righteousness. And all of this is meant to say, if I don't mention your name before I speak, uh, you're in a very high level of righteousness. So. <laughs> but I do want to uh, say, uh, introduce just a few people uh, who are here. And for those who I'm uh, admitting, keep that righteousness lesson in mind. First of all, uh, I'm sure everyone in this room knows that uh, putting together a program of this sort, it doesn't just happen magically. It takes a great deal of work on the part of staff. And uh, we have a very dedicated, wonderful staff here at the American Jewish Archives. And I do want to introduce a person who sort of oversees all of this and has done so together with me for, believe it or not, it's true, 34 years, and that's Lisa Frankel. I also see, I think I see two members, distinguished members of the HUC faculty in the room, and since they were both my teachers, I want to introduce them. First of all, a uh, very wonderful teacher and mentor, Professor Samuel Gringas, who's back there. And one of my very favorite teachers, uh, Professor Ed Goldman, over back there, Ed. Uh, so uh, before we, we'll, we'll have a few announcements at the very end, but I do want to also introduce uh, the director of our Skirball Museum, who is, the Skirball is located on the absolute opposite side of the American Jewish Archives, but that doesn't mean 
we're 180 degrees apart. And we are good partners, and that's uh, Abby Schwartz. So Abby wants Abby. So Abby wants to say a few words about the exhibition that's going on at the Skirball that's related to what we're doing this evening. called Striking Metal, 50 Years of the Jewish American Hall of Fame, which we plan to have here and keep open for the month of May, uh, because everyone in that hall of fame is an important Jewish American. And so the nominee for uh, 2019 is none other than Isaac Mayer Wadi. So very appropriate on the anniversary of the 200th, 200th anniversary of his birth. So we hope that after the lecture, um, You'll come and uh, see that. The museum will be open. Uh, we will have staff there. You don't need us. It's very self-explanatory. Uh, but it's on the fourth floor. So we hope that you'll take the elevator and go up to four. And if you haven't seen that yet, come and see it. We are keeping it open until the end of July, which is not what was originally planned. But I hope that doesn't stop you from coming over tonight to see it with us. Because if you're here, it's not raining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I just want to double check. Is uh, Dr. Rich in the room? No? Okay. Well, the reason. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, Laurel Wolfson, please. Director of our Cincinnati Cloud Library. Belt it out there because we're, we're, we're on a live streaming. There's thousands listening, no doubt. Yeah. Thank you. And now, finally, for the most important person of all that I wish to introduce, my bride of almost 43 years, about without whom nothing would be worthwhile, give it up for my beautiful bride, <laughs> Steffi Zola. <laughs> I was asking about Dr. Rich because Dr. Rich just published, uh, just came today in the mail that I ordered it, uh, a new book. Uh, on Henry Mack. So those of you in Cincinnati who know the Mack family, uh, this is one of the progenitors of that family. It's a very interesting story. I haven't yet read the book, but I'm looking forward to it uh, because I know about the Macks. And uh, any of you who are very interested in Cincinnati history, I thought it's possible that Dr. Rich might be here. Uh, we actually have some important documents uh, about this man in the American Jewish Archives. So I'm going to begin. Uh, I'm your, 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 your pre-evening uh, entertainment. And if it's too painful for you to uh, look at this countenance, then you can uh, soothe your eyes by keeping an eye on the screens uh, where I'll have some augment uh, 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 augmenting information. OK. So uh, let's begin. 
uh, 119 years ago, on March the 24th, 1900, Isaac Mayer Wise arose, dressed, and prepared himself for his usual hectic schedule on the Sabbath day. Seated in his finely appointed horse-drawn carriage, Wise slowly traveled the several blocks from his home at 16, 615 Mound Street to his congregation's magnificent house of prayer on Plum Street, an edifice that Isaac Wise referred to as my Alhambra. He led services as per usual on that morning, preaching, we know from documentary evidence, on the theme of blessings. After services, he may have taken lunch at home or perhaps at a local restaurant, as was his custom from time to time on the Sabbath. And then later on, that same Sabbath afternoon, uh, Wise returned to Plum Street Temple, where he taught his weekly Shabbat afternoon course to Hebrew Union College students. Now, in spite of the fact that Wise's 81st birthday was only a few days away, the sage of Cincinnati showed no signs of slowing down. Towards the end of class, Wise suddenly took ill. He was taken back to his home on Mound Street, where his health vacillated over the next 24 hours. The following day, he fell into a coma, and then he died quietly on March the 26th, 1900. News of Wise's sudden death unleashed a torrent of grief, not only in the city, but in the nation and internationally. The next day, his body was carried back to the temple, the temple he had built 35 years earlier, where it lay in state as, according to the newspapers, 10,000 Cincinnatians, congregants and community leaders, passed by the rabbi's beer and paid their final respects to a man who, according to the newspapers, was worshipped by American Jews, a rabbi whom his contemporaries referred to as the light of modern Israel. On Thursday, March the 29th, a day that would have been Wise's 81st birthday, Cincinnati provided the late rabbi with one of the largest and most elaborate funerals in the city's history. The press insisted that thousands of people jammed the streets when Wise was carried to his final resting place at the Walnut Hills Cemetery. And to this day, an imposing monument which surpasses all others in height serves as a symbolic reminder that Isaac Mayer Wise towers in death just as he did in the land of the living. Now much has been written about Isaac Mayer Wise, and no doubt future historians will continue to assess this man's very long, very significant, and very important career. Yet there is one aspect of Wise that remains a mystery, his voice. Contemporaries memorialized him as a charming, charismatic, compelling orator. 
but it's really impossible to gauge or assess the accuracy of these claims because Wise died a few years before the practice of recording famous voices on Edison's incredible talking machine came into vogue. But today, through the magic and the resourcefulness of the revolutionary technological era in which we are currently living, it is, of course, possible to make wise a three-dimensional human being, a virtual person. Here's how. Everything can be done if we are all united before God. Now, uh, as I said, uh, there's so much to say about wise. Perhaps right off the bat, we should begin with the arresting fact that almost all of the institutions that he founded continue to exist to this very day. Wise's newspaper, the Israelite, then to be called the American Israelite, is still published weekly and is today the oldest Anglo-Jewish newspaper in the United States and the second oldest Anglo-Jewish periodical in the entire world. The congregation that called Wise to Cincinnati, B'nai Jezurin, now known as the Isaac Mayer Wise Temple, it, he, under his direction, built a magnificent, world-class, world-famous house of prayer on 8th and Plum in 1866. And that building still stands and is still universally regarded as one of the most awe-inspiring synagogal edifices in the world. The Union of American Hebrew Congregations, today known as the Union for Reform Judaism, was founded by Wise in 1873. It is America's oldest national Jewish congregational union, a union that began with 34 congregations, but today is composed of nearly 900 member congregations. And the CCAR, the Central Conference of American Rabbis, founded in 1889, this, too, is today the nation's oldest rabbinical association in continuous existence. And, of course, the capstone on Wise's communal creativity is the Hebrew Union College, the oldest rabbinical seminary in the Western Hemisphere and the last component of Wise's remarkable Jewish national superstructure to remain anchored here in the Queen City. Now today, as all of us know, HUC boasts of four wonderful campuses, yet those who are familiar with the school's name anywhere in the world still continue to identify the school with Cincinnati because here it was founded in 1875, and here it has flourished ever since. One of the most interesting and little-known facts about Isaac Mayer Wise's career has to do with his determination to establish a theological school that was capable of educating rabbis for American Judaism here in the Queen City, and not in New York, or Philadelphia, or in Baltimore. Bear in mind that during these years that followed the Civil War, New York possessed the largest Jewish population in America. But Cincinnati laid claim to the second largest Jewry in the nation. By nature and by instinct, Wise was incapable of viewing himself or his community as a second stringer. 
His decision to come to Cincinnati was based on his belief that Cincinnati's Jewish community would enable him to achieve greatness, even more immortality. When he came here to Cincinnati, when he was called here, he writes in his reminiscences of why it was he chose to settle here in the middle of the country, saying, Cincinnati lies in the center of the country. The people there are young and aspiring and not yet cast into a fixed mold. I shall go to Cincinnati, start a new weekly journal, give Judaism a powerful impetus, and avenge myself for the good of humanity on the narrow religious bigots so that they will think of me for a century. Now, from the very beginning of his tenure in Cincinnati, Wise dreamed of launching a school of higher Jewish learning for the purpose of educating rabbis that would serve American Jewry. He had been in Cincinnati less than one year when he confidently asserted, we think that there is but one university required for these United States. Cincinnati is, according to our ju judgment, the best situated for this institute. Now, such self-confident bravado uh, did little, of course, to help wise win friends and influence Jewish leaders <laughs> in important cities such as New York and Philadelphia. In fact, many Jewish leaders resented Wise and his ambitious plans, and at times, as we know from documents, his tendentious personality. Wise earned for himself many opponents, and they worked often together to thwart his aspirations and to prevent him from fashioning himself into what he hoped to be, which would be the guiding light of American Jewry. The prayer book struggles that took place at this very time offer a very colorful example of the opposition that Wise encountered from his uh, colleagues in New York or Philadelphia. In 1857, Wise created, edited, a prayer book for his congregation, B'nai Jezrin. It was a liturgy he called, as you see, Minhag America, which in English would be the American ritual. Wise ardently hoped that his prayer book would become the standard liturgy to be used in synagogues all across America. It would be an American ritual. And it would have been quite a nice boon both emotionally and financially, had the rabbis on the eastern seaboard agreed to use Minhag America. This hope would go unanswered. In spite of the fact that Wise's prayer book was a rather popular choice here in the Midwest and in the South, most of the synagogues in New York, in Pennsylvania, in Maryland, they eschewed Wise's liturgy and created their own or selected other options. In the 1850s and 60s, Wise was the darling of modernizing Judaism in the Cincinnati area and, in fact, throughout what we call the Mississippi Basin. Yet the East Coast acquired for itself exceptionally distinguished rabbis. They brought these rabbis to America from Europe, and these men had towering reformist credentials. For example, New York's Congregation Emanuel brought Rabbi Samuel Adler to the United States in the year 1857. Prior to coming to the United States, Adler had been the chief rabbi of Alze in the Rhineland. 
And only a few years later, Reform Congregation Knesseth Israel in Philadelphia lured the chief rabbi of Luxembourg, Rabbi Samuel Hirsch, to America. Wise's most formidable opponent, of course, was the fiery reformer Rabbi David Einhorn, who immigrated in 1855 to the United States to serve Baltimore's Har Sinai congregation. And then Einhorn went on to serve congregations in Philadelphia and in New York. So these prominent, highly regarded rabbis, they possessed what we might call German reform gravitas. And that made it difficult for the Americanizing, rough and tumble wise in Cincinnati to make them these older, more distinguished rabbis into his subjects, into his loyal disciples. Now, on September the 11th, 1868, Congregation Emanuel of New York City, leading reform congregation, formally dedicated a magnificent new synagogue building that was located then on the corner of Fifth Avenue and 43rd Street. The New York Times crowned the new splendid Jewish temple as an architectural sensation. It was a win for the Gotham City. Emmanuel, believe it or not, invited Wise to be a keynote speaker on that auspicious occasion. And Wise must have been thrilled to receive such an invitation because it would give him an opportunity to impress and hopefully win over, if not the rabbis, then the influential laity who were members of this congregation. We know that Wise delivered a very important and memorable sermon on that occasion because, as usual, he published it in his own newspaper, The Israelite, the following week. <laughs> in spite of the eloquence of the sermon he delivered, Wise's inspirational address evidently failed to help him reach his goal, that being to transform the wealthy and influential members of Emmanuel into, if you will, disciples of the wise. In fact, less than two years later, in the year 1870, Emmanuel's new rabbi, who spoke with a British accent, Gustav Gottheil, he announced in the newspapers the temple's intention of establishing a theological seminary for Jewish ministers, thereby snatching away Wise's long desired and coveted dream of planting America's rabbinical school in the soil of Cincinnati. So Wise wasted no time in responding to this announcement in the pages of his own paper, The American Israelite. Of course, Wise could not possibly disagree with the need to establish a theological school for American Jewry. After all, he had been pushing this very idea for nearly two decades. He would seem like a very great hypocrite if he suddenly said, we don't need such a school. But instead of challenging the need for the school, Wise boldly asserts in this article that the reason the school should not be in New York is because the approach they have taken to funding the school was certain to fail. Wise noted that in announcing the creation of their own its own seminary, the temple says that a number of wealthy New Yorkers had pledged to donate large sums of money that would enable the school to run for the next year or two. And Wise leaped upon this fact and commended the donors for their generosity. But 
he predicts this money will ultimately run out soon enough and the new school will be stillborn. For America's rabbinical seminary, he claimed, would never survive if it depended on the annual support from a cadre of generous philanthropic donors. An American rabbinical school, Wise wrote, must receive annual support from the American Jewish community, from Jewish congregations. That, he said, was the only certain way to sustain a rabbinical seminary in this new country. Yes, donors could be had to enhance the school, but there had to be a steady flow of support that would prove to the donors that American Jews wanted this kind of a school. This was the only way, Wise said in his article, that a theological school could become a permanent reality. And he concludes, as you will see in just a minute, his remarkable editorial with an unforgettable sockdologer. He writes, tell them to thank heaven that Isaac M. Wise is in Cincinnati and not New York. <laughs> now, Wise returns to his focus to Cincinnati, and there's no time to waste. Wise needed to act fast. Two and a half years later, he had succeeded in persuading a man by the name of Henry Adler, who was a member, by the way, of Adith Israel Congregation, to offer up, as you see, $10,000 to fund the creation of a congregational union only to get this $10,000 if that union could be created for the purpose of sustaining a Hebrew theological college in two years' time or less. By 1873, Adler's challenge had been met. 34 Jewish congregations had agreed to join together and create an association that Wise called the Union of American Hebrew congregations. Now my chidush, my innovation this evening, is to point out something that's not a surprise, and that is not even one New York congregation or Pennsylvania congregation or Maryland congregation joined this union. And in fact, the Philadelphia and Baltimore Jews firmly and insistently refused to participate. And in 1875, when he was able to fulfill the ambition of his life, when the doors of the Hebrew Union College opened in October of that year, the Eastern Congregation still refused to support the school. They would abstain from helping. They refused to capitulate to Wise's leadership and they would demonstrate no support for his American school in Cincinnati, Ohio. Now this remarkable turn of events that would ultimately persuade the New Yorkers to do an about face and to join the Union and to subject themselves to the hegemony of Isaac Mayer Wise is a wonderful though very little known story that was one of Wise's favorite yarns, and aren't you lucky, <laughs> I'm going to share it with you. In 1878, one of Wise's lifelong friends, a man by the name of Dr. Joseph Louis, actually a pal from Radnitz in Bohemia, where this man, as a very young man, was in Wise's congregation there in Bohemia, had come to America in the same year that Wise emigrated, in the 18, year 1846, had happened to be in Albany living when Wise becomes the rabbi of his first congregation in Albany. 
and they became friends when there was a split in that congregation, which I won't go into in detail, the famous fight that took place. The very first worship service that ever occurs after the split, the break-off congregation that Wise leads, takes place in the home of Dr. Louis. And if you'd like to see the reading table, which was a piece of furniture in the Louis household, you just have to, after our evening ends, go across the way to the Skirball Museum where it's on permanent display. It was given to the college as a gift in the year 1908. Now, these men, Louis and Wise, were buddies and pals, and they knew each other from childhood. And so, according to both of these men, in the year 1878, three years after the founding of the college, Louis invites Wise to come to Saratoga Springs, New York, for a vacation. But Wise demurs. He's too busy. He doesn't want to leave his responsibilities. He doesn't want to go away and do nothing. He's not into that. But Louis, Louis persists and encourages him. He needs time off, and it'll be great. They'll be together. They'll have a good time. So evidently, Louis was persuasive to his old pal. And he literally dragoons wise into the vacation haven in New York. And the two old pals spend some leisure time together. And there, by happenstance, or perhaps providentially, who should be there at the very same time but a cadre of buddies who are members of Congregation Emanuel in New York City, a whole bevy of rich Jews from that congregation who are on vacation living it up. And Louis knows these men, and he introduces these men to Isaac Mayer Wise, or in some cases reintroduces them since he had spoken there. Men such as the longtime president of the congregation in New York, a man by the name of Louis May, or perhaps the wealthy banker, Jesse Seligman, uh, especially the lawyer, Moses Schloss, was important because Schloss was, prior to being at Emmanuel, at Albany and remembered wise as a young rabbi. And these men were impressed by their friend Louis, who considered himself to be wise's greatest booster. And the both of them tell the same story that after something of a rollicking evening of adult beverages and pipe smoking and so forth, Wise decides to speak about his idea of, a school, of his school in Cincinnati and that he would like their support. He wants them to join the union. So Wise assures his wealthy drinking buddies at the Saratoga Hotel that if they join the union, he will see to it that the union meets that summer in New York. They won't have to travel so far. <laughs> and Cincinnati can be the home of the American Jewish Seminary. And Emanuel's theological school, which was floundering anyway, could become a feeder school for the great center in Cincinnati. Well, Emanuel's uh, leadership did, in fact, we know, without question, attend what was called the sixth annual council meeting of the UAHC, which did take place in New York that later that summer. And shortly thereafter, it is a fact that Emanuel Congregation officially joins the union. And from that point forward, once the great Emanuel joins the union, other East Coast congregations begin to join the union one after the other, as if to say, if it's good enough for Emmanuel, it's good enough for me. Now, to the end of his days, Wise credited this chance occurrence in Saratoga Spring as being the key factor in enabling HUC to actually fly. 
Wise, after this meeting, was on a sure path to becoming, you'll forgive me, the kingfish of American Jewish life, or as he was labeled the day after he passed away, the Moses of American Jewry. Wise in Cincinnati had become the Nestor, the master of American Jewish organizational life. Now, friends, before we conclude, let us briefly turn to that sermon that Wise delivered when he spoke as the keynote speaker at the 1868 dedication ceremonies for Emmanuel's building on the corner of 5th and 43rd. You see, the title of that address was The Threefold Object of Judaism. And he spoke during that speech about the, he, he, he delivered these timeless words. The genius of progress will contribute largely to the threefold object of Judaism. First, it will contribute blessings to yourselves and to your posterity. Second, it will contribute blessings to the Jewish people. And third, it will be a blessing to humankind. It is interesting to note that the three objectives that Wise outlined in this beautiful sermon, first, Judaism enhancing our lives as individuals, second, Judaism that enriches the heritage of our people, and third, Judaism that is able to contribute to the human condition, or what we refer to today with the nomenclature tikkun olam, that these three objectives actually guided Wise's vision over the course of his life. And those that he had outlined that night were those that uh, still are relevant to this day. Let me elucidate. First, Wise asserted that Judaism needed to enrich the lives of those who were its adherents. And he repeatedly stressed this conviction that centuries of cruel oppression in the diaspora had left Jews demoralized and therefore robbed Jews of their self-respect. And this is why he declared, the Jew respects not the fellow man in another Jew because he lacks the consciousness of manhood in himself. He parodies and imitates because he has lost himself. After diagnosing this evil, he wrote, I set myself to seeking a remedy. That remedy, Wise concluded, was Jewish education. And friends, for the entirety of Wise's career, he focused on Jewish learning. He did so in his very first pulpit in Albany, New York, where he created a school program that was stunningly successful, remarkably progressive, that included education for both men and women, and this mission becomes his all-consuming task once he comes here to Cincinnati, where he creates at the Lodge Street Synagogue what he would call a religious school for children of the city of Cincinnati called the Talmud Yelodim for youth that was really the envy of the city. He was in Cincinnati, of course, only a year when he then established the first school of higher Jewish learning in the United States, a school called Zion College, 
That school was very short-lived. It was out of business in a year, but it was anticipatory of Wise's great ultimate ambition, the dream that in fact did come into existence in 1875 with the founding of the Hebrew Union College. And here, friends, Wise gave American Jewry its greatest treasure, a vibrant school that would provide American Jewry with rabbis, cantors, educators, communal leaders, men and women who were native to American culture and who would be fully equipped to perpetuate Jewish life in America because it was a unique environment in all of diaspora history. As Wise later reflected, his goal was, quote, to bring before the public the bright side of Jewish character, thus to arouse a feeling of self-respect. Now second, Wise aspired to build up Judaism itself, not just the Jew, but the Jewish experience. And to do this, he felt there was only one way to make this happen, and that would be learned, committed, visionary leaders who would serve the Jewish people. Wise believed in a distinguished rabbinate. He loathed the shameless charlatans and the ignorant imposters who posed as Judaism's religious leaders in the mid-19th century. In America, Wise took note carefully of the efflorescence of respected theological schools, many that were attached to distinguished institutions of higher education. The finest and the most spect respected Christian clergy, he noticed, were particularly the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians, and the Unitarians. These admired clergy in America were highly educated clergy. They had gone to seminary, and Wise wanted American Jews to be led by the same kind of distinguished leaders, scholars who were steeped not only in Jewish texts, that was important, but who could in fact stand toe to toe in terms of education in the secular world with their Christian counterparts. And it is for this reason, friends, that from the first day the college opened, HUC was an eight-year program. Students spent four years earning a high school diploma and subsequently four years at the University of Cincinnati earning a BA and all eight years in the afternoon studying Jewish subjects <coughs> while earning their secular degrees. Little wonder HUC's earliest graduates at the turn of the 20th century really impressed their communities, both the Jews and the non-Jews alike. Yet Wise not only forged an image of respected and distinguished rabbis in America, but he also did something very important. He imparted to his students a genuine love of Jewish life, of Jewish literature, and of the Jewish people. Listen now to the words of one of his students, a rabbi by the name of Max Raisin, who lived until the 1950s, but memorialized Wise in Hebrew in his autobiography entitled Mi Pinkaso Shell Rabbi from a rabbinic diary. In English, this is what he wrote. Wise was loved by his students, not only because of the generosity of his spirit, his closeness to them, and his concern for their situations, but also and particularly because he treated Judaism and the rabbinate seriously. He saw theirs as the holy task of preserving Judaism and ensuring its perpetuity in the world. He influenced his students to love the rabbinate despite the difficulties which it entailed. Finally, Wise believed the Jewish people 
had an important contribution to make to all humankind. Now, as a student of the German Enlightenment, Wise became thoroughly convinced that humankind would continue to get better, to improve, and here is how he might have said that were he here this evening. We are destroying the old prejudices of color, race, tongue, and former condition, and unfurling the banner of the unity of the human family by and in its ethical nature. Wise was convinced that Judaism's ethical teachings could contribute to the betterment of humankind and the improvement of human civilization. And he earnestly believed that Judaism, particularly in America, was uniquely situated to help American democracy fulfill the high aspirations of the nation's founders. And he taught his many students to follow in his footsteps. Wise's legendary commitment to the notion that educated and self-respecting Jews could benefit all humankind is captured in a wonderful story that one alumnus would retell about our charismatic founder. On one occasion, Dr. Wise evidently fell ill while he was teaching a class of rabbinical students. He stood up and attempted to leave the platform, and the student could see he was a bit wobbly. So the young and eager rabbinic student jumped up from his seat, grabbed his teacher's arm, and said, may I help you down, doctor? The famous rabbi shifted his glance and said in a voice loud enough for the rest of the class to hear, Never help a person down, my boy. Rabbis should always help people up. So in commemorating, as we have this evening, the 200th anniversary of Isaac Mayer Wise's birth, we cannot help but acknowledge that Wise predicted we would be thinking of him for a century, whereas <laughs> Here we have outdone even his self-assessment. And we have to acknowledge also the many blessings that we have not only in this room, but all of American Jewry and the whole Jewish world have received as a birthright bequeathed to us as a right, as a legacy, because of Isaac Mayer Wise. First, our Hebrew Union College and all of the educational derivatives that it generates. Second, the presence of a learned and dedicated cadre of spiritual leaders who to this day strive at the very least to ensure that an ancient and noble heritage will yet continue for another generation. And finally, he stoked a flame that continues to burn, a conviction that our Jewish heritage will play a leading role, an important role, in helping the American nation and indeed world Jewry reach the highest aspirations of what not only America, but what Jewish ethical tradition would want us to be as human beings, that is, bringing humankind closer to one another and realizing that still, unfortunately, very far off day when, as the prophet declared, all will sit under his or her vine and under his or her fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. And finally, 
as we remember Wise this evening on the 200th anniversary of his birth. Who else should have the last word <laughs> other than Isaac Mayer Wise? Whenever God should call me, and I must lay aside my work, and people will come to ask, Who is this man? Then say what you know and tell the truth. And, if you can, say, He feared God and led man up to him. Dr. Wise, we have said what we can, and hopefully we have told the truth. And so now, friends, let us all together resolve to cherish the gifts about which I spoke, and through our good work, do our very best to convey those gifts to yet another generation. Let us resolve together not to disappoint him. Thank you very much. So now, uh, just a few brief announcements, and then we'll be dismissed. Lisa. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Want to mention programs oh, for? Yep. Okay. We have a couple programs this fall. The HAA is partnering, partnering with the Leo Beck Institute to speak about the transit electric relationship between German and American Jewry. So on September 17th, there will be a series of talks related to the subject. We will include our own Dr. Zola, who will provide an overview of the role of women rabbis in the history of American Judaism, both then and now. Rabbi Sally Freetown, who most of you probably know, was the first woman rabbi ordained in America, will be delivering a talk about Rabbi Rosina Novak, the first woman rabbi ordained in Germany and one of the few women guys. Rabbi Novak is said to be murdered in Auschwitz, but her story lives on as an inspiration to women rabbis around the world. The program will also feature a presentation by Rabbi Claudia Schultz, the rabbi recently ordained in Germany, who will speak about the women, uh, the rabbinic, the women in the rabbi Uh, I, we want everybody to who's going to be with us for dinner to sit, right? Yes. Uh, yes. So, 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 so